So today, I'll spend most of the time uh, today talking about um, congestion control um, by endpoint driven wireless physical layer capacity measurements. And this is really re very relevant uh, to 5G new radio um, that I know that uh, the company is very interested in. So I hope it's gonna be of interest to many of you, but I'm gonna start um, with an overview of um, my group, the uh, Princeton Wireless Advanced Systems, um, Advanced Wireless Systems Research Group or PAWS. Um, and you can see our website, paws.cs.princeton.edu. Um, it's a, a modest sized group of uh, six graduate students um, and one postdoc. And uh, we work on a variety of um, topics in uh, wireless systems that are, some are more practical like the congestion control that I'll talk about uh, today. Um, and some are much more blue sky. So I'm gonna start, um, and, and you see a list of the, the research topics that we, uh, that we work on below. Um, and that list is also the outline of my talk to you today. So I'm gonna start with um, some, uh, an ongoing thrust of, of work um, just for five minutes on um, smart surfaces uh, for wireless networks. Um, and that has to do with making uh, surfaces indoors, the building itself, more amenable to wireless networking. Um, and um, that also may be of interest to the 5G and 6G roadmaps um, in the future. Um, the second topic I'll talk to you about today is, is quantum computation for wireless networks. And that's a much more blue sky um, topic um, and I'm going to be brief uh, on the quantum computation uh, topic today because um, in a couple of weeks or a few weeks, my colleague from my colleague and collaborator Davide Venturelli from NASA Ames um, Research Lab and University Space Research Association, he will be talking to you in depth about that quantum computation for wireless networks topic. So I'll be brief there. And then finally, the third thing uh, I'll talk to you today, and that will be the, the most, um, the longest thing will be the congestion control. Um, but we also work on a number of other topics, which you see there below. Um, we're also, we're, we're, we're looking at technologies in particular, I'll just say for sensing and localization and particularly with, um, with smart vehicles. So if anyone's interested in those topics, um, do reach out to me and I'll be happy to talk further. So um, apart from that, I'm gonna follow this outline of the three things you see here, beginning with smart surfaces. Okay, so um, this is a, uh, this is a uh, up and coming new area and um, we have uh, two and more um, ways of building smart surfaces. The basic idea, um, as you see down here below, um, is that your wall is going to be instrumented. Walls in the indoor building are gonna be instrumented with um, very, very low cost, low power, inexpensive elements. And what's interesting is that we already know how to build um, these elements um, from all the work that our, uh, the research and industry have done on building um, low cost, low power devices. And so one way of thinking about um, smart surfaces is we're taking all these low power elements and we're asking, you know, what if we, they're so low cost, we can put hundreds and hundreds of them, thousands even, embedded in the walls of a building. And what can we do with these elements um, that will make wireless networks such as Wi-Fi and LTE and 5G and cellular radio work better. And so um, Leia is a, a very, very primitive first step um, in this endeavor. And um, you can think of this as, as the, the kind of the, the most, the simplest thing um, that you can do. So um, looking at the Leia element I have pictured here, um, you have some communication between a mobile device and the access point. And that communication will go through the wall in many circumstances. And so if you instrument your wall with tons of these Leia elements, then you have a good chance of impacting what the, uh, the radio wave does when it goes through the wall. 
And I'm going to kind of explain to you in a second why that might be interesting. So the layer element is the simplest possible thing you can imagine. It's an antenna on one side of the wall connected by a very short cable to a phase shifter in the middle and then an Apache antenna on the other side of the wall. And what happens is the, the wireless signal from the, from the mobile device hits that first leftmost antenna, goes through the phase shifter, and then gets repeated out the other end with a, a shift in phase. And so, as many of you will know, indoors, multipath propagation is really prevalent. So when a mobile device indoors is talking to, say, a Wi-Fi access point nearby, there's going to be many, many paths, some of which go through that wall, others of which don't. And so the, the kind of task beyond the hardware that we're looking at um, with Leia is how do we configure these hundreds to thousands of Leia elements that are embedded in the wall so that we accomplish a particular goal um, for the networking communication. And one uh, straightforward goal I would propose to you is just to make the strength of this wireless link between mobile and access point much stronger so that the wireless link can go faster and your applications can push more data through and your video is smoother and everything else. Um, but you notice, and I want to really emphasize this, that even beyond this simple hardware, we have a really interesting, really challenging computational problem of configuring all the phases of all these hundreds and thousands of elements in the wall. And so what we did with Leia was we built this control plane that uses a lightweight edge server at the edge of the network. And I won't go into the details, but we designed a protocol that lets us decompose the wireless channel that goes straight from the mobile to the access point without going through any element, decompose that channel with the channel that goes through the elements. And as many of you will know, the, the, the net, the, the, the real wireless channel is the additive sum of those two channels, one of which does not go through the elements, the other of which goes through some of the elements. And so we solved this problem of, of, um, of configuring each of the elements. Um, there's more details you can see in, in papers. And, I, and for brevity, I'm going to stop there with a description of, of how it works. But I want to actually talk a little bit about um, the result because the results are pretty interesting. So we actually deployed this. We have an IoT house at Princeton where we can um, do anything we want with the walls. We can drill lots of holes in the walls, which would what we did with Leia. So we deployed a 36 Leia element uh, deployment in a wall of the uh, Princeton IoT house. And what you see here is, um, is wired control to each of the elements. Um, but you could also imagine a very low power wireless control to many of the elements um, to make this even more, um, even more practical. So you should think of this deployment as a proof of concept. Um, but uh, in the future, I envision uh, wireless control of all these elements. Um, and you see the AP, the access point, and the client um, in our IoT house, and they're, off, they're on either side of, um, of the wall. And so the, uh, the results are really, really interesting. So I want to uh, spend just two minutes telling you about um, the results and, and why they matter. So um, what are we going to measure? We're going to measure how well the, uh, how fast the link is essentially. Um, and so we're, we're estimating the channel capacity of the link. And what we did was we really want to profile this environment really rigorously. So that kind of tells you something about my approach um, to research. I'm, I'm very experimental, but at the same time, I'm very rigorous. So I can demonstrate that this really works in practice. And so what you see here is a CDF over different links in the environment. And so to make a different link, what we did was we moved these, um, 
clients and APs around in those two rooms that you see here, separated by the layer wall. And so we have a CDF across links of channel capacity. So this tells you that, you know, the median channel capacity link was about three bits per second per hertz. And so this is telling you how well we're using the, wire, the wireless medium. And this is just Wi-Fi's um, spectral efficiency. Another word for this is spectral efficiency. How many bits can we communicate per second per hertz of, unit of uh, frequency spectrum? Okay, so the blue curve here is a CDF and its baseline. All the layer elements are off. So this is just what Wi-Fi can do. So now let's see what layer does. So we turn the layer elements on and we ask the layer elements, elements to shift their phase to make this link better and faster. So they all shift their phase and you can see that we're improving every link by about two bits per second per hertz, which is like pretty significant. That's like a, about a, a 2x improvement in terms of speed, um, in terms of channel capacity. So that's, that's good news. And, um, and we were really happy with that result, um, but we didn't stop there. So um, you might also be asking or wondering to yourself, well, um, you know, you could, you could do all this smart surface, um, you could build that, or you could just add a new access point, add another access point, add more access point infrastructure. And, and we know that um, if we do a diversity scheme, like many Wi-Fi products do, like many cellular networks do, they choose the better of the two access points to deliver information to and from the client. So how do we stack up against that? Well, the answer is um, we ran that experiment and we did many links with a diversity scheme and that's the orange curve you see here. And the first observation is that the surface is actually doing better uh, than adding another access point if you want to communicate with that uh, mobile device. So that's interesting. But the second observation is we said, okay, what if you add another access point and you turn on the surface as well? And the really, I think the really great news there is that the surface plus the diversity scheme, additional access point, which is the purple curve you see here, that's the best in terms of channel capacity. So that's giving us an additional 25% improvement over the diversity scheme alone, which is the orange curve. And then the real win, I, I, I think, is that there's synergy between surfaces and additional um, infrastructure. So to the skeptic who asks, you know, why don't you add more access points um, rather than doing a smart surface, I would answer because we can synergistically using both improve capacity of, uh, of the wireless network. So that was just a, a sense, a taste of, of, um, of Leia. And um, this is all published work. Um, I, if, you, if it's in, of interest to you, I would uh, refer you to the NSDI symposium of, uh, of this year, early this year. Um, we published this, uh, my, uh, my student uh, Juchi was uh, lead on that uh, work. Um, and uh, that later got spotlighted in um, ACM uh, SIG Mobile's um, magazine called Get Mobile. Um, and so you can read about it there as well for a, for a more brief introduction. And more recently, we're working with, um, with colleagues to um, look at more sophisticated hardware. So we're looking at meta surfaces and meta materials. Um, and that is, uh, that is also recently published in uh, the same NSDI conference uh, symposium um, for the upcoming year. And you can find all these papers on, the, um, on my group's website, which is paws, P-A-W-S dot C-S dot Princeton dot E-D-U. Um, so if, um, if any of this has been of interest, I would encourage you to check it out. Um, but I, I just, I want to close by saying that, um, you know, we're looking at, um, we're looking at the cool new hardware, which is uh, meta materials. Um, 
But in addition to that, all our designs are very, very practical um, and they make networks go faster. And so to do that, you really need to tackle that control problem of how do you control all of these elements um, as they are, uh, all, all, all these elements as they're um, deployed, all these hardware elements. And um, the algorithms that we developed in the uh, NSDI 20 paper are a great uh, first step to that. Okay, so um, I will leave uh, smart surfaces there. And uh, next, before the congestion control, I want to give you a, uh, just a teaser for what um, Davide will be talking about um, next Samsung forum, upcoming Samsung forum on quantum computation for wireless networks. So I'll just spend uh, five minutes on, on that. Um, so um, with NASA Ames, um, my group has an NSF funded collaboration called Quantum Enabled Networks or QE Nets, um, looking at uh, the following problem. So we're looking really in a setting of a, um, of a centralized radio access network. So we're, like, we're, we're saying, okay, you know, this is, the, um, this is a very popular kind of um, de facto way of deploying base stations, um, is to shift the baseband unit processing to a, a small data compute center that is shared and aggregated between multiple, um, multiple uh, base stations um, running baseband over fiber um, to, the, uh, to the actual tower. Each of those base stations, of course, are serving many, many, many clients. Um, and so the, uh, the observation that kind of kicked off this work is that, um, you know, as, as many of you know, baseband uh, processing is extremely compute intensive. Um, and uh, there's a really tight time constraint to, um, to carry out this communication. So you want to receive or um, and decode or transmit, and then you want to finish the decoding processing um, before the next uh, received frame comes in so that your hybrid ARQ protocol can continue to operate at full speed and your line speed is not impacted and you get the best performance. Um, and so that's why there's a time deadline. Um, but the second observation is that this um, decoding detection and air control code uh, decoding and processing is highly, highly compute intensive. And current designs, they trade off some, um, some performance in terms of bit error rate for a simplified computation so that they can meet this tight, tight time constraint. And so the idea is of this project, it's very blue sky, it's very far out, but we're looking at all kinds of ways of parallelizing and leveraging new types of computation so we don't have to make that trade-off between BER and computational, um, computational simplicity. So in particular with QE nets, we're saying, okay, how can quantum computation speed up these wireless networks? Now, quantum computation is far away in the future. Um, I'll be the first to admit that. Um, but there are, there do exist, um, very large analog uh, quantum computers that are able to solve problems that are of interest to such wireless applications. Um, and one of which actually exists um, at, um, at NASA Ames in California um, from D-Wave. Um, it has about 2000 um, quantum bits and it's, um, it's not a digital gate model computer. Instead, it, it's an analog computer um, and it solves a particular kind of optimization problem called quadratic unconstrained binary optimization. And so in a nutshell, you give this um, quantum annealer a matrix of, um, of, uh, of uh, values that, that's, uh, that characterize your optimization problem. And it finds a solution set of bits, of classical bits that, uh, set, uh, that minimizes, that minimizes um, this multi matrix multiplication given your input. 
And the interesting thing about the quantum computer is that it's able essentially to, um, it's able to do some hill climbing, but also to jump between the hills, if you like. Um, I'm, I'm speaking in analogies, but it's able to jump, we believe, between the hills of the, uh, of the optimization problem so that it can unstick itself from those pesky local minima that come up that, that hamper this kind of optimization problem. And so there's reason to believe that this quantum computer can solve these problems really, really quickly. Um, but the interesting thing is that the problems of interest to wireless, those are not out of the box, this unconstrained binary optimization. And so the work we've done, um, and um, we have two papers uh, so far on this topic, the work we've done um, at a very high level at, uh, at 100,000 feet is to, um, to bring these wireless problems and map them down onto the machine so that onto the uh, our quantum annealer machine so that the quantum annealer can solve these wireless problems. And the mapping is really non-trivial. So to convince you of that, I'm just gonna briefly describe um, both of these problems um, so you can see why it's, it's so interesting. Um, so the first one is uh, the problem of detecting um, MIMO transmissions on the uplink when many uh, users, mobile users, each of them sends a, uh, a symbol to a wireless base station. And so um, the maximum likelihood solution to that problem is essentially a big search that's trying to minimize the difference between what the base station receives and what the user sent as it goes through the wireless channel. So we've, um, and I, you can read the paper, it's published in the SIGCOM conference of um, last year. Um, we found a way to map that to the Cubo problem that the annealer solves. Um, and, and then the problem becomes how to make sense of what the machine returns. So let me tell you what the machine um, tells us. So the machine essentially tries to solve the problem many, many times. And each of those is called an annealing run. And each of those yields a solution. Now, one of those solutions is the correct solution is actually the solution, it corresponds to what the users actually sent. And so if we rank these solutions, it'll, based on the optimization, it'll also return an energy, an energy of the solution. And what makes the most sense is to choose the lowest energy solution as the estimate of what the user sent. So if we do this, the graph you see here shows um, the type of, uh, type of solutions we get. So we have solutions, they're ranked, and the runs are hundreds and hundreds of annealing runs. So we get hundreds and hundreds of solutions. And so we're trying to find that solution that has zero bit errors. And here it happens to be the solution ranked minimal energy. Um, but if we don't run enough, we're not gonna find that solution. So we have this trade-off between how many times we instruct the machine to run and our probability of finding that correct uh, solution. And the observation, the really, the really interesting thing here is that sometimes depending on the frequency, so the red bars you see here are the frequency of occurrence of each of these solutions. And so depending on how frequently these solutions occur, we may only want to instruct the machine to run very few times, and we will expect to find that zero bit error rate solution. Um, and so we need to find a new metric, which is um, what we did in the paper, which is time to bit error rate. So this is asking the question, okay, if for the wireless application, for the decoding, maximum likelihood decoding application, 
you need a bit error rate of say 10 to the minus six, then what's the expected time you need to run on the machine, on the quantum machine, so that you will have in expectation, you will find that correct solution. And so that's what this graph here on the, uh, on the lower right hand corner is asking. And so you can see that we can work with significant numbers of users, up to 60 users. Um, we're doing BPSK. Uh, we've also run QPSK, 16 QAM um, in other results. And basically the, in terms of the machine time, we only need tens, tens to hundreds of microseconds in order to reach interesting bit error rates um, from this machine. So um, that's just a taste of uh, the large MIMO decoding. Um, I'll refer you to the SIGCOM paper for that. Um, and then I'll move now to the, um, the other application that we're looking at, which is uh, in the wireless stack, this lies above um, MIMO detection. So this is looking at how well we can decode um, low density parity check uh, codes on quantum ELR hardware. So this is interesting because LDPC is extensively used in Wi-Fi, 5G new radio, satellite comms, um, deep space comms, um, all, kinds of, all kinds of areas, <coughs> excuse me, as you know. Um, this was recently published in, uh, in this year's Mobicom conference. Actually, it's gonna be presented um, next month. My, uh, my student, my grad student, uh, Shrikar Kasi, is going to present that at, at Mobicom next month. So I encourage you to um, I encourage you to look uh, there uh, for more details. You can find the paper on our website as well. Um, but what this is doing is it's um, it's solving the decoding problem for LDPC codes. So what does that look like? Well, the structure of an LDPC code um, you can um, you can describe you can find that described as something called a Tanner graph. Um, so essentially the idea is you take some set of data bits uh, that you want to transmit and that Tanner graph adds uh, another set of redundant parity bits um, that are related to the data bits by these check bits you see here on the upper um, side of the Tanner graph. And the rule is that, you know, the, uh, the check bit of the, the, par the bits that are connected to a common check bit, they all have to sum up to zero. So you solve for the, you solve to encode, you solve for the, um, for the check bits um, so that all those checks uh, sum to zero and you send the whole thing. And so when you decode, uh, the traditional decoders are taking received information and they're propagating information, soft information up and down the Tanner graph to make there be agreement between the, all the bits um, that is, are being decoded. And once there's agreement between all the, all the check bits and the parity bits, once the information goes up and down and propagates and it all agrees, then with high probability, you have a correct uh, decoding and LDPC is correcting bit errors. And so I won't go into details of how, but you can read the paper to see how. But we essentially, we, um, we realized this kind of decoder on the qubit, the quantum bit connectivity graph um, that, um, that, the, uh, that the quantum annealer machine uses. And instead of a belief propagation decoder, the, um, the beliefs, they propagate between the qubits, not in distinct rounds like um, traditional LDPC belief propagation decoders do, but all the information kind of propagates at the same time between the qubits and they find a solution or a decoding um, that tends to satisfy the same parity checks um, that the Tanner graph gives. 
And so um, the really interesting thing is that we can um, achieve a better bit error rate performance with, um, with uh, this belief propagation. So at very low SNRs, we tend to be you know, with uh, the soft belief propagation decoders. Um, but as SNR increases past, say, uh, seven or eight uh, decibels, um, which is already pretty low for a, uh, for a Wi-Fi network or, a, or even a cellular network, um, we start, uh, there's, there tends to be a, an, a, not an error floor, but we tend to plunge down in terms of bit error rate um, where the soft uh, belief propagation decoders are still at a higher bit error rate. And so we are um, with a processing time of you know, just tens to hundreds, again, of microseconds, um, we are decoding and achieving a very low bit error rate, um, which is what you want out of the, um, out of the error control coding. Also, the good news is um, that as the quantum annealer machine sizes um, grow and grow, we're gonna be able to solve bigger and bigger codes. So the current code we solve is uh, LDPC, the block length is, um, it's relatively small, it's 420 coded bits, um, but future, and that's where we are here on this graph in terms of the current uh, 2000 bit uh, D-Wave machine. But uh, year on year, these annealers are growing. Already this year, we're expecting a 10,000 bit machine and so um, within you know, five to 10 years, um, we're gonna be at some very interesting uh, block lengths, very practical block lengths. Okay, so I'll leave that there for the quantum computation. If that's of interest, um, first of all, go to the website. Uh, we have two papers up there on, uh, two or three papers up there on quantum, uh, quantum computation for wireless networks already. Um, and also I'll refer you to uh, the upcoming Samsung, for Samsung forum where Davide uh, Venturelli will be describing um, our current uh, work there. So now let me turn now to the congestion control um, on, uh, for wireless networks. So just to introduce this uh, congestion control to you. Um, so, Many, many uh, downlink data flows nowadays are terminating, as, as you all know, at a wireless uh, last top of the network. And so these could be, um, what, what could these flows be at a mobile client? This, this could be teleconferencing, this could be video on demand, this could be simply using um, apps and, and web browsing on the internet. Um, but, um, Compared to the wired links that go from that edge server through the customer's ISPs, um, the wireless last hop is doing the most damage to data flows because compared to the wired links, it is the most um, unreliable. And so um, the idea that I want to kind of uh, convince you of today for this uh, congestion control is that the endpoints themselves are best positioned to measure wireless congestion. And so the design I'm gonna tell you about makes those endpoint measurements from the mobile client and then feeds back those measurements to the content server via this uh, well-defined API. And so we have a, a well-defined end-to-end um, -end reliable transport protocol that realizes all of this. Okay, so where does this come from? So um, kind of the, um, the, the, uh, the goal of um, decades of research actually in, um, in computer networks um, is this concept called exact congestion control. And the idea is that if in the network you knew exactly where the bottleneck capacity was, you would design a congestion control algorithm that would operate at exactly that bottleneck capacity in the network. And Kleinrock in the 19, uh, 1970s and 1980s um, introduced these ideas. They're classic, classical ideas 
of an optimal operating point in the network. Um, more recently, we have this BBR work from Google that showed that under some circumstances, um, namely that, you know, in wired networks, things are pretty stable. So, you know, they kind of showed that, you know, we could actually achieve this with a practical algorithm. Um, but they didn't do the wireless part. And that's, that's essentially what we've done with this, um, with this SIGCOM paper. And actually, Yashang will be presenting, uh, my postdoc Yashang Xie will be presenting this work at SIGCOM um, in the month of August uh, coming up. So, um, of course, the challenge here is estimating the bottleneck capacity, especially when it varies really quickly. And most other protocols use end-to-end -end measurements to estimate the capacity. Um, but with wireless, that's pretty problematic. And the reason is with wireless, capacity really varies really quickly and really significantly. So many of you will be familiar with, um, with how wireless networks operate, but for those who aren't, it's essentially OFDMA, where we have multiple users sharing both frequency and time, blocks in frequency and time, where a given block is allocated to a particular user, in this case, user two, and those are called physical resource blocks. And so depending on the wireless channel quality, one physical resource blocks can represent a widely varying number of bits in terms of how many bits you can stuff into that physical resource block. So as users move around mobility, things change really quickly. And so user mobility, that's a big reason that um, capacity varies rapidly in cellular networks, but it's not the only reason. So first of all, uh, all the classical reasons, users are coming and going and starting up flows and, and terminating flows. And so when that happens, different amounts of computation, competition between mobile users are going to cause the allocated bandwidth from base station to each user to fluctuate rapidly, rapidly. And these wired end-to-end -end protocols like BBR, they can't really keep up with that. Um, but also, and the third reason is particularly um, important, um, and some of you will know this, um, carrier aggregation. So there, the idea is that if you have a, an individual user, one base station might be serving that user, or you might have three base stations um, serving that one user all at the same time. And those base stations, they get switched on and off rapidly. And so when that happens, when they get switched on and off, the available capacity to that individual user is gonna fluctuate up and down really rapidly. And we need an end-to-end -end protocol that is going to leverage and take advantage of those fluctuations. And previous protocols just can't do that. Okay, so the opportunity is all of this picture the resource allocation blocks, the carrier aggregation, the physical layer configuration, as many of you know, that gets broadcasted by the tower on a physical layer control channel. And so the mobile device is really um, best situated to immediately know this information, this picture of how much capacity it has instantaneously. And so we have a tool that allows us to snoop on the cell towers with a really fine grained uh, and get extract all this information, not only um, with regards to the capacity that that particular user is um, allocated, but unlike other tools in this area, we can also snoop on the capacity that other users are allocated. So we can see you know, at user one, for example, we can see the allocation for user one, and we can see the allocation for users two, user three, user four, and so on. And so then we can make really clever, really smart decisions about how much, um, how much capacity user one should grab in future time slots. 
Okay, so I will leave the details of the control channel decoder to uh, to the paper. You can you can look on the SIGCOM website or the PAWS website, and you can see that information. Um, and I'll skip to the um, the kind of the big picture here. So what we have here is the mobile client here on the right hand side, and it's snooping on the physical layer control messages on the wireless channel, and it's estimating the rate that the server here on the left-hand side should accelerate and send at, or decelerate and send at. And it's, it's um, putting those rates back into acknowledgement uh, packets and feeding them back over the end-to-end -end protocol to the server. Now, um, you might be noticing that um, in terms of the timescales here, the mobile client is going to see the, the rate changes at um, one millisecond granularity because each of the subframes in, in, um, in the cellular network, it changes every one millisecond. Um, but the good news here is that uh, with the internet architecture these days, it's, um, it's an edge cloud architecture. So this content server here on the right, that's gonna be you know, 20 milliseconds away or less even from the mobile client. And so the delay in sending back this information to the server will be a propagation delay of about 10 or 20 milliseconds. But after that, we have explicit rate control. And by adapting so quickly, we are doing the best we can in terms of pushing the control back to the edge server and the server changing its data rate. And so you'll see that in comparison with every other end-to-end -end protocol, practical end-to-end -end protocol that exists today, we get a performance improvement um, in this design. Okay, so not only, so everything I've told you kind of assumes that the bottleneck of the end-to-end -end connection is at the cellular link um, itself. And so when we, um, and that may or may not be the case. Now, our experiments show that most of the time the, um, the sending rate bottleneck is at the cellular link itself but sometimes the bottleneck shifts over to the internet link. And then in that case, we will be saturating or oversaturating the cellular link. And so we have a way of, uh, I won't go into the details here, but we have a, a way of detecting when that happens. And then we can, we can stop that, we can put a stop to that, and we can, um, we can switch over to an end-to-end -end protocol to handle bottlenecks in the internet. Um, and there we look a, a little bit more like BBR, but we are aware of where the bottleneck is so we can quickly switch back to the wireless um, then. Okay, so let me now tell you a little bit more about um, results of, uh, of how this uh, works. So we implemented this. Again, um, this is completely practical. Um, the uh, the best implementation of this is going to be customized cellular firmware inside um, the phone itself. So we don't need actually any modification to the ASIC hardware of the uh, phone. All we need is the firmware because the firmware, the cellular firmware, is responsible for decoding the, um, the control channel. And so our um, proof of concept implementation um, uses a software defined radio to, to accomplish that task. But in terms of the computation required, it's pretty minimal. And um, we, are, uh, we have a pretty good idea of how we would customize the cellular firmware um, to accomplish the same thing. You could imagine it would be like a, a six month kind of technology transfer effort, and this could be um, realized on a real phone. So the proof of concepts is on software-defined radio. Okay, so we're, uh, 
we're in our evaluation, we're configuring uh, Amazon uh, Web Service servers as the uh, senders, and we're using three different mobile uh, devices, and we're comparing against uh, state of the art of uh, all the best um, algor uh, congestion control algorithms in all the top conferences. So those include algorithms that are designed for cellular networks like Sprout and Verus. Um, those include the algorithms that are currently deployed in Linux and Windows like BBR and Cubic. Um, and those also include the, the uh, recent years SIGCOM congestion control algorithms like uh, COPA and PCC. Um, and uh, different phones are using different levels of, um, of aggregation. Okay, so um, I'm going to go pretty fast because I want to leave time for questions, but um, basically we're, we're testing many different locations. So here's a CDF of throughput across location. The black curve here is the baseline, which is BBR. And then all these points are comparing um, us versus BBR. So here on the left-hand side is throughput. So the red points are us. So most of the time we're getting better throughput than BBR, and that's good. Um, other algorithms are coming close to us in throughput, but now let's look at delay. So let, let's look at end-to-end -end delay of the flows. So here on the right-hand side is 95th percentile end-to-end -end delay. Here's a CDF across locations. The baseline is BBR again. Better delay is to the left here. So you can see that simultaneously, we're getting much lower delay, 40 to 80 milliseconds of delay. So why is that important? Because you want for your video conferencing, for your uh, video telephony, you want high throughput and delay simultaneously. And so we plot that out on these graphs of one-way delay here versus throughput. And these uh, confidence intervals are, these, these boxes rather, are telling you the confidence intervals. And you can see that for a variety of situations, indoors, outdoors, busy cells, bu busy hours, quiet hours, we're simultaneously getting better throughput and lower delay compared to all these uh, uh, algorithms. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, just the takeaway of, of, this, of this work is it's really the first end-to-end -end congestion control that's practical, we think, and it seamlessly integrates wireless capacity measurements in, in its design. And so it's really, we feel, on the roadmap to 5G new radio. Um, and the small cells that are, and the, uh, the massive MIMO that's gonna be um, really prevalent in 5G and 6G um, roadmaps. And so um, we think this is a great opportunity to, um, to uh, you know, have the best end-to-end -end congestion control for video and for um, interactive applications. Uh, and you can, find, uh, you can find it on archive or on the PAUSE website. And I think I have uh, five or 10 minutes left for questions. Um, so I will stop there and, um, and take questions. And I'll just say before that, uh, it's a real honor to be uh, talking at the Samsung Forum. I, I thank you so much for having me. And uh, with that, I'll take questions.